Okay, so today we're going to start out with a little bit of a review of the lecture that you were supposed to watch during PCHEM. It was a lecture that wasn't given in class, but it was posted in the lab folder. We're going to go over that a little bit so I can emphasize some of the things related to uncertainty, and then we're going to apply it to the calibration chart, and then we're going to finish up with some uncertainty analysis. So uh, propagation of uncertainty, you know, we want to propagate uncertainty. That sounds bad. It's like you're making things more uncertain, but you're, you're propagating it through any mathematical steps that you've taken. So that's the main reason. Um, you saw a numerical result without an estimation of its uncertainty is useless, right? Especially in science. That's the third question. How sure are you? The first one is what is it? The second was how much is there? And the third is how sure are you? So you can't do quantitative analysis and, and really shouldn't do qualitative analysis without giving somebody an estimate of how sure you are. So directly measured quantities have easy uh, uncertainty. Like if you just, if you go buy the balance, open the box, read on the side, it says plus or minus 0 0.0002 grams. You know, that's your uncertainty. You make one measurement, you know the uncertainty in that one measurement, but then you make a volumetric concentration and then you dilute it and you have all of these other uncertainties in that operation. So that's another reason why we want to propagate those things. So a four place balance typically has, you know, plus or minus two in that last decimal place for a single measurement. But multiple measurements incorporate the other uncertainties. So that's, we could take a single measurement and single measurements of volumes and so on and do the propagation of uncertainty through that one single run. But what we typically do is we do multiple runs and calculate the standard deviation that way. So. Uh, there's there's a couple of different ways to get to a realistic value of your uncertainty. Here are the propagation of uncertainty equations. I left yours blank so that you can write them down. So let's start with the sums. So what we have on the left is an example equation. So if you're if you're doing something that has pluses and minuses, let's say you're weighing out a container and then you put some stuff in it and you weigh the container plus the stuff, you have to do a subtraction to get to the amount, the, the weight of the stuff inside that container. Well, then you would use this equation here to determine what, uh, you know, what your uncertainty was in the result, okay? And this, this equation can be summarized in the, this, this the sum of the variances. So if you notice that these are all of the uncertainties squared, added together, and, and that is equal to the uncertainty in the result squared. But if we want to just get the uncertainty in the result, we take the square root of both sides. But this is your this is your shorthand equation. Can you see that that's the same equation? Yeah. <clears throat> and remember this this sigma squared is called the variance. The variance. So the variance of the result is just the sum of the variances of all of the measurements that were added or subtracted. Now the products, these in individual pieces inside the products are the root, are the uh, relative standard deviations or RSDs. RSD. And so this, this result here, notice they're all squared and added together and then you have this Y over here. Well, this Y was, if it was over here, that would be the RSD of the result. And if it was squared, you see this simplified equation. So the RSD of the result squared is equal to the sums of all of the RSDs of the things that are multiplied and divided. So this is a very simple equation too. So these are easy to remember over here. I mean, I think all of them are not that bad, but, but this is even shorter. Now you're going to have all of these equations on the exam. I'll de I'll deliver them to you. Okay, so these will be in the exam, but you got to know how to use them. Now there are some special cases of these kinds of equations, like here the the exponent uh, version uh, is just a special case of the product one. You can prove your to yourself that these are equivalent um, if you have this situation of of a raised to the x power. Um, and then we have the log and anti-log examples. Now, uh, if, I'm going to go ahead and move on because we've got a lot of ground to cover. If you didn't get them all written down, there is the video on Blackboard that I'll put up after this. Okay. 
And so let's let's talk about an example. This is a simple example, but this does show you that we use these uncertainties to make decisions sometimes. Okay. And so in this case, we have a metallic object weighing two and a half grams, and you put it in a grad cylinder, and you can see that it it dis, it displaced 0.13 mils of water. What's its density? And then the question is, can we tell if this is gold or tungsten? So this is pretty simple. You take the mass over the volume, that's the density. So this is the mass of the object, that's the volume it displaced. And we put that in our calculator and we get all of these extra digits in our calculator. And we look at this and we say, well, you know, I've got four significant figures here. So I'm gonna round this result to four significant figures, 19.25, clearly it's tungsten, piece of cake, right? But we've got uncertainties here. Where is our uncertainty in this mass measurement? It's actually in the second digit. So we're uncertain here, okay? Where's our uncertainty in the, in the volume measurement? It's also in the second digit, you see? Here's our uncertainty. So how does that figure into our result and what decisions do we need to make in this case? So let's propagate the uncertainty in this example. It's a simple one, it's a division. It's a mass over volume. So we'll use that second equation on the previous page. So here's our uncertainty analysis. We've got this result, okay? And so in, the, in that example earlier, it was like uh, Y equals A over B, right? So do you see that this is the same example as we had before? And so this is our Y value in that example before. And so uh, we end up with Y times the square root of the RSDs of each of those pieces squared. And so this is the y value here from using that equation on the previous page. And then this is the RSD for the mass measurement. So RSD, I'll say A, and this is RSDB, right? So looking at that previous equation, those are your two relative standard deviations. Now at this point, it's real simple to see uh, which one of these is worse for you. Um, one way to, to do this with all these decimal places, you, you realize when you're doing a ratio, um, you know, so it's almost like you could, you could move this decimal place over here or whatever, as long as you do the same to the top and bottom. And so you could say that this is the same as five over 13. You see that? And this one is the same as two over 25, or, you know, you could say that's, that's one over 13 right, one over 12 and a half. So this one, is, the, the mass uncertainty is one thirteenth and the volume uncertainty is five thirteenths. So which is worse? The volume one, the volume uncertainty is worse. Now I'm just doing a quick uncertainty analysis to show that if I was gonna try to improve this system, I'd try to figure out how to make my volume measurement better, okay. So that's just a side trip. We did a little side trip to say, which one of these uncertainties is killing me? Okay, because look what it tells us. This is the uncertainty in our density. So our uncertainty in density is 7.6 grams per mil. That's pretty bad. Okay, so what would our reported value be? Our reported value would not have four significant figures. It would only have three or really two. Um, you can see most of the time people will keep one, they, they always keep one uncertain digit. Sometimes they keep two. You see it both in the literature. Okay. And so we're certain that it's, that it's more than 10, but we don't know really much about the ones place. We have an uncertainty of, of plus or minus 7.6. So this is, this is the best we could report. 19.3 plus or minus 7.6 grams per mil. So this second question, can you tell if it's gold or tungsten? No, we really can't. Even though our calculator told us the number looked more like tungsten's value, we really can't lean on that result because we have such uncertainty in our volume measurement. It was just coincidental that it was exactly, you know, for four digits looked like tungsten. Okay, so let's look at this in a graphical view. Okay, this is our RSD for the volume. And this is our RSD for the mass. You see, it's a little narrower. 
So the volume RSD has got a wider distribution. The mass is a little bit narrower. Combining these two, I get the result in density. Okay. All right. So let's look at uh, what this means in terms of our confidence interval. So we measured this object and we got our uncertainty, you know, in our measurement. And these are the densities of all these metals. Okay. So our result was right here, our, our 19.3 is right here, 19.3. And the, the real value is somewhere under that curve. Now, it's probably close to our measurement, but it could be pretty far away. It could be as high as 35. It could be as low as two, but it's not very probable that it's that far away. It's more probable that it's close to 19.3, okay? But look at this, if, if we were to just do a, 50% confidence. So there's a 50-50 chance that it's that it's one of these. So this area under this curve here is, is 0.5 of the area of the whole thing. So that's what we mean by 50% confidence. We're covering 50% of the possible results with these two limits. Okay. And so that includes tungsten and gold and tantalum and rhenium and platinum and osmium and iridium and so on. But a lot of times we want to report 95% confidence intervals. So this, this purple bar down here is a 95% confidence. So if we want to say it's, we're 95% confident the density of this object is between these two limits, centered on 19.3, this is how many metals it would contain. Okay. So Again, we're going to use our uncertainty to make a decision. We can't say that it's tungsten or gold. In fact, we, we have a 95% chance of it being one of these metals. But there are metals that are, that are outside of this. And so one of those would be down here, these really non-dense metals. Where's my pen? Okay. These right here. Okay. And so for sure, we could say with 95% confidence, it's not magnesium. Okay. If it were magnesium, we would have less than a 5% chance of it giving us that mass and that volume. It would be a bigger volume. Okay. And so this is, uh, we can make a decision on this uncertainty, but we can't say anything about those other elements. There's a 95% chance it's one of those other elements. Any questions on this? This is a super important way to think. Yes. So in a situation like this where you would make an eight point nine or something such that it's not this, you could you wouldn't be able to put this on your shirt like you mentioned. Yeah, you could lift leave this list that there's a ninety five percent chance it's one of these metals. And since magnesium is on this list, there's less than a five percent chance it's magnesium. Yeah. And, and that way you would use the, your confidence as a guide in your speaking, right? You can't say it's absolutely not magnesium because there is a small chance that it's magnesium, but it's less than 5%. Yeah. In fact, you might even say it's less than 2.5% because we have 5% over, or we have 2.5% over here and 2.5% over here. Okay. And so... Magnesium is actually in that two and a half percent tail. So, and you can say, yeah, but the math worked out that the number was closest to tungsten, but there are no yeah buts. Okay. You hear people say that all the time. Yeah, but this or yeah, but that. I mean, my kids would do that. And I always wanted to ball cap say, my name's not yeah, but <laughs> every measurement has uncertainty, even if you don't know what that uncertainty is. And we've had bridges fall and unexpectedly, and we've skipped, you know, spacecraft off of Mars. Um, so you can't tell with more than 50% confidence that the element is one of these. So let's, uh, that's just an example of, of uh, sort of the statistical way of reporting data. Hey, let's, um, <clears throat> let's dive in now to using it and applying it to the calibration curve, since we do that in analytical so much and in forensics. So here's an external standard calibration curve. And it's a good one. We've got three nines in our R squared value. Uh, we've got our Y equals, you know, 400 something times X plus uh, 1200. 
And, and so we have these area accounts over here, maybe something like a GC or a LC. We're integrating the chromatogram. You have lots of, uh, lots of signal associated with your, um, with your particular drug of interest here. And these are parts per billion cocaine, so it's a very sensitive technique. And so these are our standards. And so the question is, when I apply this calibration curve, I measure several Y values. So I measure three of my unknowns to calibrate and constant, you know, find the concentration of those. And then we come across and apply this calibration curve and we come up with the, the concentration, okay? Uh, this equation turns X into Y. But then when we, when we apply it, we're taking Y and we're turning it into X. You see, so we're kind of running this equation backwards. And so how do we calculate the uncertainty in X? What's our plus minus on that? And so let's look at that. This is a propagation of uncertainty calculation. So the trend line is, is not useful because it lacks uncertainty estimates. So notice on here, we don't have the plus or minus for the B or the M. So Y equals MX plus B, the typical linear equation. What's the plus or minus SB? And what's the plus or minus MB or, or SM? We need to know those values so that we can propagate this uncertainty. So we go to the analysis of variance table. We take those, those uh, calibration points and we put them into Excel and we pick, we go to regression analysis under the analysis tool pack. We had to do this in PCM. You go over there and you pick regression and then you select the X values for your X input, the Y values for your Y input, do regression. And here we get this table. Okay, we get the same R squared value. Down here, we get the coefficients. They should match your trend line. If they don't, then something got screwed up. Okay, so you see down here, the equation is the same, 12, 13.6, point, point, yeah, or 7, and 4, 16.59. So these all match, the R squared matches, and everything's great. But this is the column that you're looking for right here, the standard error column. So now we know we have this plus or minus 120 as our SB, and we have this plus or minus 5.9 as our SM. Those are the things we need to be able to propagate this uncertainty from a Y measurement back to the uncertainty in X. Okay, so let's see how we do this. So uh, given a Y value, plus or minus an SY, how do we find SX, that uncertainty in X? So here's our area counts uh, per parts per billion. So there's a slope associated with it, area counts per PBB. And then our, our intercept, which is also this area counts. Um, that's actually just area counts. It's not a ratio. So let me scratch this last part out. Okay. And then, uh, oh no, that's SM. I'm sorry, I thought that was B, sorry. Trust the notes. Okay. And then the SB is 120 area counts. So we have all of these values. And then we run three check samples. So we did our 125 parts per billion check sample. Okay. So that's how much we think we put in to our calibration curve. We ran it three times. These are the area counts. And so we end up with this area, this average area, and the standard deviation of those three. Okay. So right there, we have, we have Y and SY. And we want to calculate X and SX. So we have Y and SY, M and SM, B and SB. And we want to find X. So these are our Y and SY values. So with all of that information, we can go through our propagation of uncertainty in this linear equation. Okay, so what is X? That's pretty easy. We rearrange this equation to solve for X. So it's Y minus B over M. Okay, so 55333 three, three, three minus 1214 over 416.6. So it's 129 parts per billion. It's close to what we thought it was gonna be. We said it was 125 and it came out to be 129.9. Okay, that's great. What's our uncertainty? I mean, are we really off or are we so uncertain that we, we actually hit the true value within our limits of uncertainty? Okay, that's a good question. So what is our uncertainty in this linear fit? 
So this is how we do the propagation of uncertainty. So here's our equation. And it's interesting. Remember our equation types were y equals a plus b minus c. Remember that was the, the top row of that equation sheet. Or y equals a times b divided by c. Look at this equation. It's a combination. It's got an addition or subtraction piece, and it's got a ratio piece. So we're going to have to do this calculation in two parts. So we have to do, the, just like we would do in our, in our math, we typically do the subtraction first and then take the ratio. So we're going to do the propagation of uncertainty for the subtraction piece, the numerator first, and then we're going to do the propagation of uncertainty for the ratio piece. So we need a new term. We need to call this top piece the numerator. Okay, so we'll find the uncertainty in the numerator, and then we can do the division piece. So this is a subtraction and a division. So the numerator is y minus b. So that's the 55, 333 minus oh, 14. And so we get 54, uh, 119 counts. That's the numerator. And so we need to find the uncertainty in the numerator. You see, it's pretty easy. We're just doing it in two parts. The uncertainty for the numerator is that equation that we had on that first page. This is the piece that most people forget to do or do it incorrectly. So we take the uncertainty for the y value, which is right here, the, the 1512 or 1528, you see that, and square it. And we take the uncertainty for b, which is 120, and we square that. Take, add those together and take the square root, and that's our uncertainty in the numerator. So there's our S numerator. And now we can use that in the division equation. We can calculate the relative standard deviation of the numerator divided by the numerator and this relative standard deviation for the slope. So here, you see, we need that value there so that we can calculate this RSD. And then the, the slope values, these guys right here, go into this equation. You see where all the numbers come from? Okay. So here's everything all put together. 1532 divided by 54,000, 5.9 divided by 416, times our y value gives our uncertainty in x, or our x value time gives our uncertainty in x. So it's 4.1 parts per billion. It's, it looks kind of tedious, but it's not that bad. Just do it in two steps. Do the subtraction piece, then do the ratio. So this is what we would report if we were just reporting plus or minus the standard deviation. We'll get to 95% confidence intervals in the next lecture. Okay. So at this point, we're just promoting or reporting the, the mean plus or minus one standard deviation. And so we can see that it's it's 129.9 plus or minus 4.1. It gets us down to 125.1. Like if we're down at that, you know, it just barely nicks the the true value. But that's great. So so this is a, this is a good result. Okay. So there are are there any questions about this procedure? This is this is the essential skill for doing analytical chemistry is turning your y values into x values that have uh, a known uncertainty. So I'll pause for a minute to see if there's anything I can clarify. Can you say another yeah, this, this will be, th but this skill, you see it's just applying the two equations that you have. So you will have, you will have the, that, equation sheet that had the, all the different types, addition, subtraction, and multiplication, and all of that. And you'll be able, need to be able to apply it to this yourself. Yeah, good question. Okay. All right, that's good. Okay, so this is, let's talk now about the confidence. We, we showed the confidence intervals with the tungsten uh, gold example. What causes these these shifts. So think about how complicated just that gas chromatograph measurement was. I mean, these are all the molecules percolating through this 30 meter tube. Some move faster than others. There's little defects in the solid phase. The flow rate may change a little bit over time. And those things, the longer the, the tube, the capillary tube, the more those peaks spread out. And, and so 
you know, we're, we're getting some width to our peaks. We also have injection differences. Uh, that's why we try to use auto injectors. Those reduce the, the, the run to run, uh, uh, you know, it's really crazy when you when you have to do it by hand or manually you punch start while you stick in the syringe and push it all in and there's just that's a pretty complicated procedure and for you to do it exactly the same every time it's just very difficult okay and so that's going to shift your um your retention times okay and and so you're going to be introducing uncertainty every time and then you have little power fluctuations there's just a, a billion little uh, tiny fluctuations, you know, and if it's just two, I mean, you're taking your true value and shifting it by one small amount. If there's three, if the fluctuations are the same size, then you end up with this one, two, one intensity. If there's four, you end up with one, three, three, one, because there's three possibilities to hit, get here. You could go to the right, left, and right, 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 left. We go left, right, right. You see there's three possibilities or ways to get this result. Anybody ever see the game Plinko? You put the, the disc in there and it advances it's exactly what's going on here. And that's where those intensities come from. Okay. Um, then you end up with one, four, six, four, one. Does anybody from organic chemistry remember what this intensity pattern is called? You, you looked at it, I know. It was when you were studying NMR. These are the intensity patterns for the little spin, spin splittings and so on that you had uh, with the with the NMR. It was Pascal's triangle. But if we go down to like a, a near infinite number of variations, we end up with the Gaussian distribution. So the normal distribution is what results from this tiny little fluctuation of, of up and downs. Um, and so we have some confidence that the true value is somewhere inside this peak. Okay. And so we, we look at that and we say, okay, what are, the, what are the probabilities of being far from the mean versus the probabilities of being close to the mean? And, and depending upon the standard deviations, we have different shapes of, or it's the same shape, but a different spread of this Gaussian curve. Uh, notice that the, the normal distribution is, is normalized, and that's why we call it normal. The normalized or normal distribution has an area of one. And so whenever we look at the standard deviation, if you, if you report the value plus or minus one standard deviation, you're covering 0.683 of the area. So if you integrated that from minus one to plus one, your result would be 0.683. So that's a 68.3% area. Another way to say, if you measured this 100 times, 68 of your values would be in this region. Okay. If you wanted to capture more of that distribution, you could go plus or minus two standard deviations. And then that covers 95.4% of the area. So if you measured this 100 times, 95 of your measurements would be in that region, plus or minus two standard deviations. If you wanted to capture three standard deviations, if you wanted to go out that far, that'd be 99.7. Let's say plus or minus three si uh, sigma. Okay, this is plus or minus two sigma, and this is plus or minus one. Now that's 95.4, but a lot of times we quote 95. So how many sigmas do we go plus or minus to get exactly 95? Does anybody know that number? Come on. People will be amazed if you raise your hand and say that number. And then you can pat yourself on the back. You have, you've had a good day. Okay. Anyone? Is it close to two? Yeah, because 2 is 95.4. It's 1.96. Commit that to memory. The 95% plus or minus is 1.96. So 95% is plus or minus 1.96 sigma. Okay. So that's our... 
that's what we use for our confidence intervals for 95% confidence. So a 95 uh, confidence interval is just a range of values that is likely to contain the true value. We do our measurements, but we don't know the true value. So we're saying how confident the true value is given our measurement. So we give our measurement, we have our plus or minus, we do 1.96 times our uncertainty, and we say our true value is in that region with 95% confidence, okay? That just means still though, out of 20 experiments, one out of 20, it might be outside that range, okay? Now this also applies when you have normal distribution or Gaussian statistics. That's why in the control charting, we're using Gaussian statistics. We don't want to have something that's that's a category data, you know, that's non, not continuously variable. So that's why I wanted to improve your uh, data choices. So here are some practical considerations. 99% confidence, even that stakes. That's 20,000 lost articles of mail per hour, okay? Unsafe drinking water for 15 minutes a day, 5,000 incorrect surgeries a week. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? Two long or short landings at most major airports. So every airport having, you know, at least two long or short landings. Um, 200,000 wrong prescriptions every year. So how do we not die? I mean, 99% confidence is pretty tight. And we've got all of these things that we do on a daily basis. And yet... Um, you know, with 6, 16,000 murders, this was in 2008, 162 wrongful convictions. If we were operating the justice system on a 99% confidence interval, and we don't even use that, we use 95%. So how do we avoid even more of these egregious errors? And that is we couple our techniques so that they don't overlap. And we have not just one technique that is, is uh, deciding what this substance is. We use at least two techniques or sometimes three techniques. And we hope to avoid the Swiss cheese problem, right? The Swiss cheese problem is where you get unlucky and all the holes align and you can see right through the block, <laughs> right? All of our techniques have holes, but we hope that the holes don't line up, okay? And so the more techniques that we use to make a decision, the, the less likely it is that the holes will line up. Does that make sense? Okay. So one of the things that we do, at least in, in, in my background and in, in some of the industrial chemistry, is we, we try to um, be really far from our specification limit. So we use this term Six Sigma. Six Sigma is a quality organization, a mindset, a, a training that you can go through, and it attempts to design a process that seeks to have less than 4.3 defects per million opportunities. Now that would be pretty good, right? Less, less than 4.3 uh, incorrect measurements per million opportunities, or like in a vehicle, uh, no vehicle comes off the line perfect, but they want of all the, the million opportunities for failure, whether it be the tires or the door hinges or whatever, uh, they want less than 4.3 defects per million opportunities, okay? And one of the ways you do that is you, you take your measurement and your uncertainties and you say, we want that specification limit to be six of those sigmas away. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's six sigmas. We are way far away from that specification limit. So this process would not even yield 4.3 defects per million opportunities. We're, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, you know, we're 15 sigmas away. I mean, that's, that's unmeasurably small. So if you're this far from your specification limit, you can be incredibly confident. This would be something like, let's just apply it to, to like a seized drug situation. Like this might be the, the, the limit for some particular, you know, like possession, say possession of, um, let's say, possession of, of marijuana above two ounces, right? And so this is two ounces. And this is like 10 pounds, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're, is it less than two ounces? No, 
It's not. I mean, feel this. I don't even have to use the analytical balance, you know, but you can measure it. You can weigh it on the balance. Then you get your uncertainties and you're saying, look, there's no way the uncertainty in our measurement of mass is going to accidentally say this thing is is less than two ounces, you know. So so that's a, an example of, of forensic application. Let's look at some of the propagation of uncertainty examples that we have. These are in your notes. You can go through them. Uh, there's some serial dilution problems here. Um, so here's here's a problem where you have a standard, uh, one mil standard, uh, the stock solution. Notice some are in milligrams per mil milliliter, some are in parts per billion, and so on. And all of these are worked out for you um, right here. Again, I have them in the video, uh, but I want to get to the last page before we run out of time. So I'm just going to go through these quickly. Here's a measurement using a burette. Uh, where we can estimate that uncertainty as half a tick mark or 0.05 mils. And, and here's the uncertainty using a pH meter and, and the concentration of HCl. Okay, and this is kind of interesting. You can see that the uncertainty here is 5% in the concentration and the result is 2%. And then here we have a pH measurement where the uncertainty is 2% in the pH and the result is 5% in the concentration. So they, they kind of mirror each other. So that's what you would expect from the math. Okay. Um, and so these final comments, precision is satisfying, but it's not related to accuracy. So next, uh, when we get into the calibration curves and so on, we're gonna really focus on the accuracy question. But today we're really just really focused on the precision measurement, trying to figure out what our precision is. And, and uh, let's see, I wanna get to this last. Oh, never mind. Okay, so let me just show you some examples of, uh, of what we did in one of our research experiments. So this is the output from Minitab, which is a statistical package that you guys can uh, get like a 90-day license for. So if you go out and, and download it, uh, it kind of fluctuates. Sometimes the university has it available for students on university computers. And so you can go to the computer lab and you can, you know, install it and, and use it. And then other times the license lapses. So, um, you know, we can, we can explore to see if it's available. But Minitab produces all of these uh, great statistical values with just like one menu click. Think about doing all this in Excel, which you'll get the opportunity to do uh, next week, I think, is, is calculating the mean, the standard deviation, the range, and all of these statistical values. Uh, but let's look at, at some of the statistical values uh, in this experiment. We were doing cleanliness studies. And so if a metal surface has been cleaned, you know, it's, um, it's got a low contact angle. So you can measure this contact angle on the inside of the drop with various techniques. And so that's what's being measured here. We see that the mean was 60 plus or minus this range here. Okay, and if it's got a high contact angle like this one, then it's dirty, right? The water is beating up. Now that actually is, is clean on a car, but we're talking about a metal surface, not a waxed surface. So on a, on a metal surface, we would want the water to wet the surface. That tells us it's free from oils and greases. Okay, and so our mean was 59 or 58.5 and our standard deviation was 9.6. And so then we had, you know, a lot of, uh, we, we greased it up and we measured our values and look, it increased up here to 103. So this was with a lot of grease on the surface, we measured the contact angle and, uh, and it increased. Then we wiped it off with a wipe. So we, we wiped all of the grease off of this coupon and it looked clean. You know, there was no visible residue at all. And all we did was sort of make the filth more uniform, <laughs> right? It's still dirty, it's still, got grease on it. Even though you couldn't see it, we could detect it with water. And, and we got rid of, uh, you know, the spread in the data. Our standard deviation dropped to 2.6. So then we put it in an ultrasonic tank with some soapy water and ran it for a while. And, and it dissolved all of that grease off the surface and cleaned it very well. And then it dropped down to 48 uh, with a plus or minus, uh, you know, standard deviation of 6.9. And you can see it's also much better than it was originally. So original received, look how, how wide the variability was in the original coupon. Um, we were testing our statistical methods and our measurement methods. That's why we went through this. And so we saw that we could detect a dirty coupon. We could clean it with hand wiping. It didn't do much. 
but it did sort of make the surface more uniform. And then we showed that the ultrasonic tank could effectively clean it off and it created a more uniformly clean surface. So uh, we're going to go in the course in the next couple of weeks and talk about all of these other figures of merit like skewness and kurtosis, the different quartiles. We're gonna look for outliers, all kinds of things. We have our 95% confidence intervals and everything like that. So we're gonna study all of these different um, statistical values. And are there any questions? We've got two minutes. All right, well then y'all have a great day.